Thank you very much, Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The question of this hearing is whether we can be in an endless war with no congressional vote against newly formed terrorist groups all over the world forever. We're in year 17, and I've heard testimony before that this could go on for generations with no vote of Congress. The recent deaths of four American troops in Niger and the news about a June death of a Green Beret in Mali while deployed there on a special forces mission raised many questions about the geographic scope of America's military campaign against terrorism. And I repeat what I've often said in the last four years. It's time for Congress to have a public debate and vote about an authorization for U.S. military action against non-state terrorist groups. Many of us believe we're legally required to do so. Others believe, if not required, we would be wise to do so. General Secretary Mattis has testified in support of this on earlier occasions, as has the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dunford. Our troops in the American public deserve an open debate and vote on the extent of military operations, if not in year 17, in year 30, in year 40, in year 50. Mr. Chairman, I want to introduce for the record a contract solicitation issued by the Navy in 2014 seeking to contract with an entity able to provide casualty evacuation, search and rescue, and personnel recovery in connection with, quote, high-risk activities in Africa. Um, it designates 14 nations, five of which have been identified to Congress in War Powers Notice Letters. I find no fault with the contract solicitation. You have to plan. But I'll, I believe that this level of planning, and this is from the Obama administration era, demonstrates a contemplated scope for American counterterrorism activity in Africa, far greater than what has been briefed to Congress and significantly greater than what the American public understands. To our witnesses, Senator Flake and I have introduced an authorization for military action against ISIS al-Qaeda and the Taliban to replace 2001 and 2002, and to finally engage us in our Article I responsibility. You signed a letter to Congress on September 5th opposing the proposal. I'll introduce that for the record as well. That I think we can stipulate that this administration, like the two preceding administrations, believes that the 2001 authorization in 02 gives it broad power in this area and would rather not have any congressional revision. But we have a job to do, the Article I branch. So let me ask you about your reasoning. Your first objection to the letter to the proposal is that, quote, the legislation would arbitrarily terminate the authorization five years after date of enactment. This is inconsistent with the conditions-based approach in the president's South Asia strategy, strategy. Such a provision could also unintentionally embolden our enemies with the recognizable goal of outlasting us. The annual NDAA we pass every year expires every year. But Congress still manages to pass the next NDAA. And appropriations bills and continuing resolutions expire every year. And then they're followed by subsequent appropriations. And other critical national security legislation must have legislation like FISA, for example, commonly have an expiration date and a need for congressional reauthorization. Do either of you view the annual expiration of the NDAA or defense appropriations as Congress, quote, arbitrarily terminating our support for the military? Uh, no, sir. We have several hundred years uh, that this works. It may be imperfectly with continuing resolutions, but I suggest the AUMF is substantially different. Do you have any evidence that the annual expiration of the NDA or defense appropriations unintentionally emboldens our enemies? Uh, the, the continuing resolution has certainly inhibited our ability to adjust the military to the modern threat. Do you think the enemies are emboldened by thinking that we won't pass a CR or won't pass an appropriation? I don't think they understand those kind of intricacies, yeah. whereas an AUMF is a statement of purpose. You count on being able to get the next NDAA passed and the next appropriations bill passed because you have confidence in your request and you have confidence in Congress to take seriously the need to defend the United States. Isn't that correct? Uh, that's correct, uh, Senator. So with, my so reservation is that, for example, I have several dozen people who've been waiting some time for hearings in order to give me the civilian oversight of the Department of Defense we need and respond appropriately uh, in keeping Congress informed. And I can't seem to get mm -hmm. uh, floor votes on some and, and certainly hearings for others. So I think it's the speed at the at the speed of relevance uh, for something like this, we'd want to make certain 
that where you get into what could be construed as the not just the oversight it's but the the uh, management or direction of this fight has a degree of continuity that destroys the enemy's confidence that they can outlast. If you deemed it uh, advisable at the end of five years that we should continue the battle against these authorizations, do you doubt your ability to make the case to Congress? Or you doubt, do you doubt the ability of Congress to take seriously the need to defend the nation against terrorist organizations? Sir, I, I'm not in the political realm. I, I realize I play a political role up here, but I, I'm you, probably you don't, not. You don't doubt the, the will of Congress to battle non-state terrorist groups, do you, Secretary? Um, sir, this war is so non-traditional that I think we are. I, I understand that, but you don't doubt the will of Congress to defend the nation against non-state terrorist groups, do you? No, I do not. Can, uh, uh, a second objection, if, if I could, because I'm, I'm sorry I'm having to move, is that the resolution includes a definition of associated persons or forces that's inconsistent and could result in unnecessary uncertainty. The definition says uh, associated persons or forces or individual or entities other than a sovereign state that are part of or substantially support al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or ISIS, and are engaged in hostilities against the U.S. armed forces and other personnel. I'm just going to leave that for the record. I think it's crystal clear, and there's no uncertainty about it. Um, the third and final objection in, the, in the, your letter is that the joint resolution would create a cumbersome congressional review process for use of force against new associated forces or in new countries. Let me ask you this. Does the administration object to having to identify to Congress the associated forces we're targeting with military force? To notify us? I, I believe that under the Article 2 of the Constitution, the President has the authority to declare a threat to the United States as the elected Commander-in-Chief. Do, do you object does the administration object to notifying Congress of the associated forces against which you're taking military action? I, I don't think so, sir. We've do been you, very forthcoming with that very and, information. And, and do you object to the, uh, the need to notify Congress of the countries where military action is undertaking place? You do that in the War Powers letters, correct? We do it routinely, sir. That's, that's all that Senator Flake and I have in our resolution. We require you to notify us about countries and notify us about associated forces, and you can immediately take action against them, subject only to a resolution of disapproval by Congress, which is the current law. Just, if I could just conclude, Mr. Chair, the, based on the answers in this quick thing, and it's tough to do it so quickly, I have a hard time understanding the opposition to the resolution as any, anything other than we don't want congressional oversight. Um, there's a five-year sunset reauthorization with an opportunity to extend, just like we do in FISA, just like we do in the Patriot Act, just like we do in NDAA, just like we do in appropriations. Uh, the, the associated forces definition is extremely clear. The process for countries is not a geographic limitation. It's just a notice requirement that Congress can then affirmatively take steps under the normal rules of the Constitution to rebut. I recognize that the administration feels like it doesn't want any more authority, but to quote my colleague, we're more than a, a feedback loop. This is a constitutional power, and we shouldn't be putting troops into harm's way, and is Congress standing back and trying not to have our fingerprints on this when it's mutating all over the globe? And again, Thank I, th good. I think it's a forever war, and I, I worry about deeply about handing the power over to presidents to do this without the feel the need that to come to Congress at all. Thanks, Mr. You did a good job.